every great power has a price for its cooperation. Uh, China is seen as important in diffusing the North Korea scenario. I'm going to ask you one more question, but before I get there, I want to ask you this about China. Um, there, there, is, there is a concern that one of China's uh, um, cards in this will be in the quid pro quo. I want to have a greater hand in the South China Sea. I'll help you diffuse that. How does, how does the United States and how does the United States and its allies work to avoid that kind of an outcome that gives a stronger Xi who wants to play this hand, he wants to play it economically, he wants to write the One Belt Initiative, uh, AIIB, you know, all of these uh, uh, initiatives simultaneously from the soft power standpoint, working on getting up the hard power uh, side of things. It's in, you know, you could look at it two ways. It's in China's interest to diffuse the North Korean crisis, or it's actually really not in China's interest because it consumes so much bandwidth that all of these countries can use, for example, in applying it to China. How do you see, how does the United States have to behave in a strategic way uh, or in, in playing go to not end up in a bad position with the China that is driving its own, what it sees as millennial historic interests in the region and, you know, is, is not as bothered about the Korea situation as I think um, everybody else is? Well, Vaga, you've been watching this over the last few years unfold, and it does look like we are continue to be outmaneuvered by China, focused so heavily on this Belt and Road Initiative, which gives them both soft power and economic power uh, leverage over the entire Indo-Pacific region. The United States, meanwhile, has talked about the banner of uh, economic nationalism, is withdrawn from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the one signature multilateral trade organization, and we're also now threatening not to appoint governors to the World Trade Organization, which is seen as one of the pillars of the post-World War II international order. So it's very important, even though I skipped over the speech in Da Nang in Vietnam, where the president really has an opportunity to talk about his affirmative economic agenda for trade and investment. Yes, it's more bilateral trade at this point, but we're big on investment in this region, bigger than China in many ways. Um, and also, countries want to work with us. We're not going to indebt them at, through their Belt and Road loans uh, so that, as they just did in Sri Lanka, they forced the Sri Lankans essentially to Absolutely. take out, you know, give away their sovereignty for a port because they were so indebted they needed the Chinese bailout. Um, and I don't think, I think countries in the region are worried about that, even while China's writing, especially with the 19th Party Congress sort of sp spectacle uh, where there's no criticism at all brooked. Uh, it's all positive, you know, which is amazing, of course. Um, no democracy would have this kind of discussion where it's only 100 percent positive. There's, there, there's another side to the story. There are losers in this. Um, and I think dealing with China is, uh, is, is, is consequential. It's a it's, it's big part of the agenda for the Trump administration as for any U.S. administration. Not making grand bargains. We're not going to make a bargain to sell out Taiwan or the South China Sea. But sequencing and timing matters. So you don't expect us to be conducting our freedom of navigation operations you know, when you're in Beijing. Um, right. <laughs> um, you don't expect to be talking about uh, new maritime patrols in Beijing, but I think it's important for the United States, as it has done under the Trump administration, to routinize things like freedom of navigation operations. The last administration tried to turn freedom of navigation operations into cudgels to force and coerce China. That doesn't really work. They're really just basic exercises to make a point of international law, which is, hey, there are excessive claims, and this is the way we demonstrate what we think are excessive claims, not because we're trying to provoke a conflict. And I think trying to keep that at an even keel um, and routine uh, set of presence uh, will go a long way toward reassuring the region, not overly provoking China. The question is, how do we stop them from declaring an air defense identification zone in the South China Sea? How do we stop them from reclaiming Scarborough Shoal, the one area they haven't reclaimed, outside of the Spratleys, but right next to the Philippines? How do we stop them from essentially making the nine-dash line, which is not legal under international law, according to the July 2016 judgment out of The Hague? Um, how do we stop them from making that a reality. And I think that's going to take cooperation with a lot of countries, both in Southeast Asia, the littoral countries, building up their partner capacity, giving them early uh, warning through a better maritime domain awareness. Um, and so it's, it's going to be a continued balancing act for, for this administration as for the past. Um, you and I have uh, spoken about this, uh, the, uh, that the great thing about TPP was for nations that are very proud, Japan, every nation is, but particularly to save face, Japanese leaders, you know, told me 
the reason we made concessions on beef and cars was that it was in the context of a broader agreement. Same thing with Koreans in terms of trade disputes that we had with each of these countries. They were willing to cede to the United States under the guise that it was in a multilateral regime. Japanese uh, officials have told me flat out, uh, we look to forward to having a good relationship with the United States, but if you expect us to make cars and beef concessions that we didn't in 50 years, we're not going to do it again with you on a bilateral basis. South Koreans have said sort of a similar thing to me. What are the chances that on both of these trade fronts, these are hot button issues for both of these nations, uh, they did settle them as far as they were concerned, now they see it as the United States has reopened it. What are the dangers from your perspective on sort of the, a renegotiation or a contentious renegotiation on all sides uh, affecting the fundamental security relationship, or do you think the security relationship is such that these issues will not bubble to the fore uh, and, and disrupt, disrupt you know, the military and the defense side of the equation? So the 12 stakeholders who were part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership to include the United States all saw the arrangement as important geopolitically as they did economically. In the Trump administration has come in with an election having looked at the heartland of America and realized that lots of America was left behind by globalization, has kind of put the burden of globalization in these multilateral trade deals like the TPP, like NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, um, as the symbol of bad globalization, not helping much of America. As a result of that, <clears throat> they've separated the trade from the geopolitical. We still have a very big geopolitical need to be economically uh, engaged in terms of trade and investment. And the first step of that is for the president to talk about bilateral free trade, including with Japan. So the uh, Washington and, and Tokyo have been talking uh, about harvesting the Trans-Pacific Partnership chapters for a bilateral free trade agreement between Japan and the United States. I think the Trump administration is far more interested in that than Japan, but Japan is flexible to a point. Um, Japan, meanwhile, is working with the other members of the Trans-Pacific Partnership to do what, a, what they've called a TPP-11, or maybe 10, because New Zealand may drop out with the new government that just came to power. Um, but in any event, uh, trying to succeed in keeping the back door open for the United States to join down the road in 2021 or beyond. Uh, and I think that's important to keep that open. At the same time, the U.S. works on bilateralism we need to keep open the, the uh, path for multilateralism. Korea is a different story, of course, because we struck a bilateral Korea-U.S. free trade agreement, CHORUS, and the administration now is threatened to undo a lot of that. <clears throat> I, I think we're waiting to see what happens with the North America free trade ag uh, agreement negotiations with Canada and Mexico. That's at the moment in the balance, and it, it's kind of up the queue because NAFTA was seen as the first problem, um, hurting much of U.S. economy in uh, helping part of it, but also hurting other parts. And I think here, the Trump administration's generally um, divided. Unlike the national security front, where you have alignment of views between you know, General McMaster uh, and uh, Secretary Mattis and General Dunford, on the economic team, you have difference, right? Lighthizer um, and Ross uh, for US Trade Representative and Commerce are different from the economic advisor, Cohn, uh, from different from the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin. And I think there's some honest differences over this, but I think the outcome has been for the president to look for better deals, but not to throw away existing accords. He's kept the, these accords sort of ongoing, at least on life support. We'll see where this goes out over the next year or two. We need to do more than to keep trade on life support. We need to make sure it's a pillar of the U.S. geopolitical and economic strategy going forward. And I think there's a lot that the president can do to reassure the Koreans that we want to negotiate some new addenda to course, but we don't want to abandon course. That we want to work on the bilateral with Japan and with others in the region, and that we want to keep the back door open to TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but we don't want to throw it away completely either, because we're open to better deals in the future. That President Trump can take credit for, for ending up with a better deal for more Americans uh, than we might have had earlier. And uh, last question on Korea. Um, you and I over the years have talked and you've noted you always want to make sure that whatever measure you're taking is understood correctly by the person you're aiming at. You can't use your lens. You have to look at it through their lens. If you look at the North Korean regime, it's in business to stay in business. Um, and anything that threatens it is the concern when the president uses that kind of rhetoric or his team uses the rhetoric, well, he, he won't be in power for long, is where the concern is that the North Koreans miscalculate because uh, Kim Jong-un, just like his father have said, 
you try to take us out, we're going out in a blaze of glory. We're, we're not going out quietly. Um, talk to us about what are the next steps in this. Uh, there are folks who have increased the chance of conflict, uh, even nuclear conflict, to 20 percent, which is, which is very high. Um, you know, there are some folks who have used higher numbers than that. From your perspective, you know, is any of this rhetoric really working ultimately? Um, and what are the next steps? Because North Korea has nuclear weapons, is, is unlikely to be deterred. It's not going to give those weapons up. Uh, and so we were in a deterrent posture with the Soviet Union and China for decades. Um, you know, is that something that we're just, and, and we've, you know, North Korea has had these weapons now for more than a decade or about a decade. Is this something that we're going to have to live with uh, ultimately and use our deterrent power and then try to shape them through, through other means, perhaps even some bigger carrots to, to draw them out to drive kind of a broader change? Well, let me start with the risk. Um, you mentioned some analysts talk about a 20 percent risk of nuclear war. I don't think you can put a number on the risk here. Um, this is a pass-fail test. If we have a nuclear war, we fail. If we don't have it, to some extent, we succeed. Um, and the risk factors, though, are definitely going up. So whatever, you can't put a number on it, but yes, there is heightened risk right now. And that heightened risk is being accelerated by Kim Jong-un's uh, nuclear weapons and missile programs, that he does not want to be stopped until he gets to a deployed set of nuclear weapons that can hit U.S. territory, preferably the, co the continental United States. This seems to be a pretty safe assumption. Second point here is that Kim Jong-un, President Trump, President Moon in Seoul, Xi Jinping in Beijing, Shenzhou Abe in Tokyo, none of these leaders wants a war. Um, and um, they know that a war undermines their interests greatly. Um, and so that's one very healthy thing we have working for us. Third point here is that we don't really have any direct ties with Kim Jong-un or even his generals. Um, there's a gaping hole there. We had actually met with Kim jong Il, his father. We'd met with Kim Il-sung over the years. I'm not saying that you just sit down and you make peace, but not having any channels uh, effectively at the top level definitely takes away our, our basic intelligence in terms of how do we read, how do we signal, do we, un do we really know what he's seen when we move our shows of force around or when we talk about 24-hour sort of bombing uh, sort of uh, you know, alerts. Um, and I think there uh, it's very important for us to try to establish some channels to at least avert accidental war, um, as well as to figure out eventually how we convert this pressure strategy to some acceptable diplomatic framework, not with a final end state. You know, yes, denuclearization somewhere off there in the long term, but toward realistically, how do we just stabilize the situation right now? And I think there's a lot of interest in trying to do this. And I think there's interest in the administration in doing this, but they don't think this is the right time, especially since we've got our economic pressure now coming in behind our shows of force and our military, our, our diplomatic isolation pressure. And maybe Kim will look for something. Kim is only in his early 30s still. He is surrounded by a group of 200 to 250 young cohorts, people we don't know well, people we don't even know at all. Um, these are people who want to be around for decades. They're not people who want to, you know, see their regime end tomorrow. There's something that we can look at as in terms of long-term negotiation to both prevent accidental war and then figure out arms limitation in the long term. Those need to be elements of a comprehensive strategy that includes the, the military pressure, the diplomatic pressure, the economic strangulation. We need to put these things together with our South Korean ally, figure out what China can do, is willing to do. I'm told by some Chinese party members that they're going to be willing to do more after the party congress. We'll see. It's never enough, but I think they will be doing, doing more, if only because our economic sanctions are now threatening some of their banks and entities that are trading with North Korea. Those will be economic uh, costs imposed on China. So they're willing to do more in response to that. Um, so let's see where this ends up in, in a number of weeks. I'm pretty confident that deterrence and uh, containment uh, can work just fine in an un imperfect world. Um, but we need to constantly be ready, and I think this is where the administration has been strong on being ready for action, but where's the diplomacy in this? Eventually that has to somehow be put on the agenda. And is the rhetoric a mistake from the U.S. side, the president's rhetoric? Does it, w would we be better off without it? Well, um, I have a couple of thoughts on this that are maybe uh, 
counterintuitive. One of them is that we had become too predictable a nation uh, in terms of being able to read us uh, so carefully that Kim Jong-un even knew exactly how much pressure he could use against us. He could be more risk of, uh, acceptant because he knew we were so risk averse. Now, if people see President Trump as simply bluffing, however, then maybe that gains us nothing. I think, however, we'd all have to say honestly, we could wake up tomorrow and there could be something done. There could be a decapitation strike. There could be a reprisal strike by President Trump. I can't promise you that there won't be. And I don't think Kim Jong-un can really be that certain that there won't be some kinetic action, some cyber action, some special operations action under the Trump administration. Now, does that lead us more likely to war because he has to use it or lose it? Or does it actually lead him to diplomacy? I think it helps us lead to some diplomacy. And that's because I go back to the basic proposition that all these leaders are rational. They all don't want war. They want their sovereignty. They want their pride. They want internal control. They want a lot of other things. But they don't want a war. So I think within some bounds, it actually could be helpful. Will it really change the outcome? And here I have to be humble and say, look, nobody's been able to take North Korea really off the course from nuclear weapons and sustain that over time in our democracies. We did it for a while in the 90s, but not, not for long. Um, I think it's very, very hard to change that course. So we're probably talking about a future in which we're deterring and containing a nuclear North Korea as a temporary or interim stage. It could last a long time, but as something that is the acceptable outcome of, of where we are right now. Because if we keep ratcheting up pressure and tensions too high and only go upward, eventually there's a tipping point. We're either going to war or we're going to find a diplomatic off-ramp. And I think eventually leaders who don't want war have to find some diplomacy. Patrick Cronin, who heads the uh, Asia program here at the Center for a New American Security. Sir, thanks very much for all your time. Thank you so much, Fago. Good luck. Thank you.